All right, next up we've got Matt Estella. How you doing, Matt? Doing all right. How are you guys doing? Good. So, tell us about this Matt Estella, this enigmatic Matt Estella that no one's ever heard about. Ah, oh, you know, where to start? There's, uh, you know, obviously my uh, romance side, my uh, my personal feelings side. But uh, mainly in terms of uh, the effects and stuff that you guys want to hear about, um, I've been doing uh, VFX and CG for about 20 years now, which is terrifying. Um, I picked up uh, Houdini about five years ago, really dig it. And um, the past uh, four years now, I've been um, teaching Houdini at the uh, UTS Animalogic uh, Academy in Sydney. Very cool. Uh, I think there's a, a website that some people might have heard of that uh, <laughs> you have something to do with. Yeah, yeah, uh, CG, CG something, uh, CG Wiki, I believe you're referring to there. <laughs> I am indeed, yeah. 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 So, um, it was one of these things where uh, when I first started learning, uh, I mean, even before Houdini, just uh, when I was learning sort of little tips and tricks from people, I would I would forget them, so I started to, to write them down. Um, and, it's, and definitely when I, when I picked up Houdini, uh, I, I had to write everything down because there's just so much to learn. Um, and I shared it around and it, it got really popular, which is really cool. Yeah, very cool. And, and on behalf of side effects and the whole community, uh, we all thank you for doing that. So, ah, thanks man. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so this presentation today, what it's going to be about. Right. So this is going to be, uh, just the tips, uh, the, um, at various times of the past, I've presented kind of, you know, slick uh, work from uh, Metamologic. Uh, I've also presented kind of uh, student work. But I think what, what went down really well last time was just um, little sort of micro tips um, for people who were new to, to, to Houdini. Uh, and because uh, I didn't have much warning on this presentation, actually I had loads of, uh, loads of warning, I just didn't have much uh, headspace. So I, I thought of this about a week ago. I thought, well, I'll try that again. So um, especially because uh, we've got a new batch of students in, so they all started in January. Um, and speaking with them, speaking with some uh, some mates of mine from Animal, and then speaking with some of my um, online folk, um, tried to collect a bunch of tips. So I'm going to be presenting that. So it's about maybe 16 or 17 things, just you know, going from fairly easy things to a bit more kind of advanced stuff. But uh, hopefully something for everyone should be good. Right on. Let's jump in. Hey. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm uh, Matt Estella from um, CG Wiki and UTS ALA, and this is Just the Tips. Um, you might have heard in all my previous presentations, I like a heckle. I'm recording this at home. I couldn't deal without the heckle, so I brought whoop, Ben Skinner along to uh, give me a hand here to uh, do some silly stuff. So I'm gonna heckle in residence. Heckle in residence. I love it. Um, so uh, Ben is going to interject whenever he feels that is appropriate. Um, but uh, I am going to drag all. Actually, I'm going to make a mini Ben. I'm going to do this. Put us in the corner. And <laughs> and we are going to get started. Okay. So uh, last talk, I glossed over why Houdini has this this thing of using capital letter out underscore something. Uh, I will explain it properly now. So um, there's a lot of times within Houdini where you'll be uh, referencing geo from one place to another place. So you want to um, emit particles from an object or you want to drive RBD from something else. So you are going to be referencing things from, from things. So here, for example, I want to make particles off of, off of this object. So I've got a box, I subdivide it, I mountain it, and I say, okay, this is what I want to, uh, what I, what I want to uh, make particles from. So I put in a null and I've, and I've named it uh, in capitals out underscore emitter. So now if I go into my uh, popnet, um, and here's the pop source where I'm going to point it at that thing. Now the reason we do that capital letter thing is uh, whenever we have parameters which are looking for a sub node, and you have this little uh, chooser thing to go find uh, find another node, when I bring that up and I get a list of all the things in the scene. Uh, I can browse down to where I know that thing is meant to be, which is the tips. And look at this. Um, this will list all the nodes within it in alphabetical order, but it'll put everything in capital letters first. So if you're consistent and name all of your sort of important placeholder nodes in capital letters, 
uh, and name it something nice, nice and clear to follow, then it'll always be bubbled up here and be nice and easy to find. So I know that that thing is called out emitter, so I'm just going to choose that, and there we are, particles. Cool tip. Um, wire tricks. So here you can see I've got a sphere and it's wiring into a few different nodes and it's getting merged together. So let's look at a few different ways that we can merge these things. So one way is I might uh, make a merge node and I'm going to wire them one up the other by drag and dropping. That's fine, but very manual labor intensive. Another way, and this is another handy trick with wires, if you hold down with Y, your, uh, your mouse cursor becomes scissors and you can drag through wires. Very satisfying to do. To reconnect all these nodes in uh, one less step is I can drag, choose them all, click on the little uh, circle icon for one of them, and drag down. You can see that's bundled one of them all together. So I can click on, click and drag like that. That's step two. The even cooler way though is I can do that in reverse. So I choose all these nodes first, and I drag out from one of them. You see that they get bundled. If I hold them Alt and then let go. It immediately makes a merge node for me, and this is ready for the next node, so I can put down a transport or something. And it's pre-wired. That is a nice time saver. Um, magic. Magic. Um, another handy thing is you can see that uh, up here we have uh, all these nodes are being driven by uh, the are connecting to this one sphere thing. Um, if you want to uh, make stuff a bit tidier for kind of wiring networks around, you can alt-click and drag. And you get a dot, so you can you know, do things like that. The other thing you can do is you can uh, hold an Alt and click and drag through the wire. And if these are all coming from the same source, they all they will bundle together under this one dot, so you can make much much tidier node networks. That's also very handy. Um, now another thing that happens a lot is uh, you'll have a bunch of nodes. So let's put down say another uh, transform node in here. I can just drag and drop that in. Um, and what if I realize, oh, actually, I'm going to change the, the order of these two nodes. Um, you might uh, take advantage of your scissors and cut through the wires, move the order, and then drag, drag, drag. Uh, it's very slow. It's very slow. Uh, a better way to do it is you can just drag and drop the node like that, and, and Houdini will automatically flip the node order around. So there's some pretty cool tricks for doing uh, wire stuff. Uh, curvy Vs. So here is a curve. Turn on points. Um, so what you can probably barely see is I've got a point at the start, two points in the middle, and a point at the end. I'm going to make the size bigger of these points, which we just learned how to do this before. So if you hit D and go to the point marker size here, you can you can embiggen them up. So now nice big fat point markers. Mm, handy. So big. so big. So uh, we. It will be nice to have uh, some sort of uh, UV coordinates that tells me uh, where these points are along the curve. There's two ways of doing that. Well, there's, there's probably a few more ways, but here are the two ways that I know of. Um, so a resample SOP, um, people know that that can be used uh, often with this uh, this maximum segment length option. This is the, the default mode, so you click that and you can, you can define how many extra segments are going up in the middle, but you can turn that off. And if you just turn on this option down here, this curve view attributes, that'll then uh, make you another attribute, which tells you how far along the curve each point is. But uh, you can see that this, it isn't really taking into account distance along the curve. It's just essentially uh, the, the, uh, the points uh, kind of ordering within the curve. So it's almost like it's taking uh, its, its point number, dividing it by the total num number of points, and it gives you a value. So this is uh, 0.33, this is 0.66, and the last one is a one. Sometimes handy, but uh, what if you want a measure of the actual distance along the curve? Well, for that, you can use a UV texture stop. So if you use a UV texture in ArcLink spline mode and set actual class to point, then you get this thing, where now this is actually telling me UVs in terms of distance. So these things are around the middle of the curve, so the values should be around 0.5. And sure enough, that one has a value of 0.50, and the next one has a value of 0.52. In different situations, you will require different UVs. Uh, why not have both? You can totally do that. So if I wire them one after the other, now I've got curve view that tells me it's, it's relative position uh, normalized 0 to 1, 
and I've also got the UVs that tell me uh, how long in terms of distance down the curve. Pretty handy. Any, any and they both things? work even if the line's not straight, correct? Exactly right. So if I were to uh, add a, well, like a, it's a point jitter. Yeah, let's do that. And jitter it up. You can see that uh, those values are still valid. So that's uh, 3.6 and 1.4.6. Super handy, no? Lovely. Yeah. Very handy. Very handy. Let me make sure my demos are up. Oh, no, I'm, I'm foolishly unpreempting the work I'm about to do. Pretend you can see any of this. Okay. So, <laughs> volume visualization. So, uh, whoa, it's not those points. So, here we have a uh, pig, convert it to volume with a big for polygons, and I'm adding cloud noise to make it a little bit more interesting. So, that's fabulous. Um, but, do we have any options to uh, be able to, to visualize this a bit better? Well, of course we do. So uh, we're going to put down a volume visualizer, volume visualization song. So I'm going to append that. That's using that handy shift enter trick that I uh, showed in last uh, last video. Uh, so this node, if you point it at what type of density field we have, which is density, we get what we had before, and that's fine. Um, but you have some sliders here to, to preview what this would look like if you had uh, if you were multiplying up and multiplying down the overall density. So I can push the density scale to make it be thicker, or I push it down to make it be thinner. That can be handy. Um, I've also got this thing for shadow scale, but in its default state, it doesn't do anything. Uh, and that's because this thing requires a light. So uh, a really handy uh, thing to remember is if you have a light source, so if I'm going to go up, I'm going to put down a light. And if I make sure that I'm in the uh, lighting mode, like that, and I move this light up and away a bit, you now get a preview of the lighting conditions. So I, I can get a better sense of this shape. So if I were to transform that, you can see, you can read the shape a bit more. But that's not bad, but that quality is a bit ropey. Are there ways to fix that? Of course there is. Um, the uh, default settings for how Houdini displays volumes are actually remarkably uh, low quality. Uh, to fix that, you again bring up your display options by hitting D in the viewport, go across to the texture tab, and the first one is this uh, limit resolution. I think the default is uh, 128. So essentially what it's doing is for any volume, it's going to be slicing it up into images, which in this case is going to be a 32 by 32 uh, pixel image, and it's going to have 32 of them deep. That isn't quite enough resolution to display this volume properly. So let's go up to say 256. And uh, we'll, we'll hit D, we'll, we'll close that dialog. We'll just give the, the, the viewport a tap. So I've just bypassed, I've bypassed that node. And now you can see we're getting a lot more texture resolution here, which is cool. Um, but if I start playing around with the shadow scale, you can see that it's still a little bit ropey. It's, it's quite bandy, and we're not getting a lot of, uh, we're not getting a soft kind of volume form of. And that's because of another setting in the display options, which is this uh, HDR texture option. So by default, it's just using 8-bit um, uh, standard dynamic range images for those volume previews. That's what that stands for. If you change it to at least 16-bit uh, HDR, and again, we'll do the uh, tap tap to make this work up. Now we have much nicer volume previews. So, oh, look at that creepy detail. Mm. Um, and especially now, if I move the lights, uh, you get a much nicer sense of what's going on in this volume. Pretty cool. Um, cool. More than once, uh, I have uh, been shouting at a simulation and going, "Oh, but I've upped, you know, I'm using tiny voxels and I've got super super detail and I can't <laughs> see it." Only to realize two days later, "Oh, hang on, what are my display options again?" And I've and I've had these set at their defaults. And as soon as I change it into at least these values, um, I've, I've often actually just turned it off entirely just so it goes as high as it needs. You can also control that texture resolution. On the volume fish node itself with this max vis res. So I can go up to say 512, and that'll then use as much um, resolution up to that limit to give you very sexy detail up until you no doubt um, crash your video card. But any tip. Uh, visualizing attributes. So here we have a grid, and I'm using an attribute from map to set this column uh, foo. Uh, using an image. 
So I could, um, you know, cast, uh, I could use maybe say a wrangle to, to copy food to color to see what's going on. Um, but an even easier way is, is built into Houdini now. So if I um, click on the I button over here for information, and in this in this view, I see uh, which point attributes are on my shape, and I can click on this one foo, and that will implicitly make a visualizer for me, so I can see what's going on. Um, I could click again to turn it off. So I'm doing it for foo bar. I'm adding some, some attribute noise as, as a vector, I believe. So you can see now I've got all these comms filling up. So if I go down to this last one here and hit I, I can now just flip between them to see what's going on. Pretty handy. Um, if you want to customize how this information is being displayed, you can go down the side here, down to the little uh, Google Maps sort of pushpin thing, right click on it, and uh, this lists all of the attributes that have been uh, visualized so far. And so this is visualizing the AAA attribute. And you can click on the pencil icon, and you can uh, change how this gets displayed. So at the moment, this is just displaying as color, but I might want to visualize this as, as, as vector trails. I might change this to type marker, the default is numbers. I'll change the style to the uh, vector. And now I can see what it looks like. It will change the length of it. I can change its color. It's pretty handy. Uh, visualizes, especially from uh, just pulling it up from the middle mouse button info, super handy. 15 minutes. Oh my god, I've got to rush through the next and next 15 minutes. Um, Geo spreadsheets. Yeah, you might notice in all my talks, I always have this window open. Uh, I'm eternally thankful to uh, Roger Franson, who's now at Weta, for showing me this and saying if you don't have your Geo spreadsheet open at all times, you don't really know what's going on inside Houdini. So I'm constantly hitting my students over the head to say, always have this open. Here is a good example of why. So this was a little setup I made for doing some Pyro stuff. So here I have uh, a tree made with a super cool uh, labs uh, tree uh, uh, tree tool, and I want to burn it. So uh, I use the PyroSource node. Let me make those points a bit smaller again. Uh, not enough size, but maybe three. There we are. Oh, what? Oh, okay. Let's go with the giant points then. So uh, got some points. Uh, put put some noise on it. This, that, the other. Um, I'm gonna can try this demo a little bit with this. Um, so I do all that, so I've got all this data moving at the point level, and then I convert that to volumes using the volume rasterize, and I get nothing. And it's like, what the, why is that doing that? And um, I was going back and forth on it, trying to work out what was going on. So uh, a couple of things you can do with the Geo spreadsheet to make it handy to see things. So one is that uh, at any point, if you've got you know, all this stuff and it's a bit too, too, too much information, but you only want to see what's going on with, say, these points here, I can go and uh, make sure I'm in point mode, choose some points, and under view, I can go only show selected. So now I'm only seeing those points. Let me just go a handful of points. There we are. So I can just see what's going on there. The other thing you can do is if you have uh, loads of columns and you, and you just want to see a few things, you, you can just choose what you want. So I might say, actually, I only want to see the burn fields. And I only see those. Uh, mm -hmm. And I only want to see burn and say temperature. And I can see those. So that's all pretty handy. Uh, but what was going on here? What uh, what was what was breaking the setup so that I wasn't getting any volumes coming through? Well, I know that um, this thing expects to be. Um, it, it treats each of those points as a particle, makes a little bit of volume around it, and then makes a volume. So I thought, but I'm not setting p scale anywhere. Like, where is that coming? And I went, oh, hang on, p scale. Is a p scale of zero coming from somewhere? Is it that node? No. Not that node. Not that node. Not that node. Oh, it's coming from the basic tree. So something inside this setup is setting a p scale which I don't want. So I went, aha, excellent. So I can just do an add delete. I can say remove uh, p scale. Playback forward again. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. And then, hey, my volume asteroid mm. works. So that is cool. Um, so um, GS spreadsheet, really handy. Make sure you use that. Tip seven, resources. Um, I think it's a bit of a pattern that some sort of new, new people get into to ask sort of, you know, cheap please and uh, which video should I buy and you know, which, you know, expensive course should I go on. Um, 
it's it's worth remembering that there are so many resources out there. I think you know, one of the most amazing ones uh, of late, uh, so I can pull up the right one, is uh, Houdini Blueprints, HDDP.io. This is incredible. So the fact that people are now kind of sharing setups here, you get a nice uh, visual kind of thumbnail of, of, of what's going on, and even beyond that, that you can sort of dive in and see what's going on. I'm amused to see someone has taken one of my things and uploaded it without asking. <laughs> oh well, what you can do. Um, but you can sort of you know, dive in on one of these. You see a preview of the node network. This is insane. And you can actually go Ooh. through and you know, look at the properties and you know what's actually going on at each node. And then if you want, you can then just go download it. I mean, it's an incredible resource. Like the, the work that goes into this is uh, just amazing. So thanks, Chris. Oh, I believe there's the chat behind it. Uh, what's his name? Yeah, Christian Baum. Awesome work. Uh, you should support him on, on Patreon. It's great. Uh, but beyond that, you know, the forums at Oddforce, the forums on side effects, the uh, Houdini Reddit, the uh, Facebook Houdini groups. There's so many places where people are actively sharing file sharing scenes. Oh, that's saucy. Um, it's um, it's amazing. Like I think you know, the, the the best way to learn Houdini is to just open up other people's Houdini files and play with them. So you know. Uh, do that. That's my tip. Um, copying no tricks. Yes, okay. So um, here we have uh, a guy. Why are my points? Ah, because I'm not good. Okay, yeah. right, so uh, here is uh, a node, and I'm going to say uh, transform him. So I'm going to scan him down or do something like that. Um, what if I want to repeat this operation on another object? So say I've got a box. And I want that box to have the same um, the same uh, transforms that I'm doing to this uh, to this flipping. So one way is I could you know just just copy it straight away. So I've done an alt drag and that copies a node, and then I've I reconnected. So now this box is getting the same transform as as the as the uh, rubber toy, but they're not linked. So if I were to do if I were to change this one, I'd have to then go and make sure to to, to change found as well. There's a better way. Uh, if you right click on a node and go actions, create reference copy, you get the copy of the node, but you can see that this is all in green because these this is now linked all of these parameters to the original one. So now if I change this guy, I'll just to 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 that guy. So if I move this guy, they're now linked together. A handy thing that I always forget is um, you can change it on, on either node and both will update. So I can go to this guy and I can be changing these values. Uh, and you can see that that is propagated back to back to this node, to the goal. Um, an even handier trick is there is a keyboard shortcut for that. So it's Control, Alt, Shift, Drag. And there you go, instant reference transform. Um, I have enough fingers for that. It's the Vulcan Death Bench thing, it's a bit odd. Um, a really handy trick is oftentimes when you're working in a pipeline, say you're coming, you're, you, you've got stuff coming in from, from Maya, is you will have stuff and it will come in the size of the planet and you have to put down a transform stop or you have to do something to move things into a more friendly space for Houdini. So that might be applying a, a, a transform scale, you might you know, move it to origin or whatever it is that you need to do. But then you have to remember that on the way out, you have to invert all the things you're doing. Really handy trick is create a reference copy and you you uh, delete this link. So I'm going to uh, right click on this invert transformation thing and go uh, delete channels. And I'm going to invert the transformation. So this means now this is doing exactly what this end is doing, but the exact opposite. So that means that we start from here, we do whatever we do, and then on the way out, it goes back to where it's meant to be. Super handy for our problem work. Nice. Yeah. Making controllers, this is a handy thing. So let's see if this demo works. So um, if you do um, uh, HDA work, uh, a handy sort of uh, workflow that they give you is for all the nodes which are inside, um, you can right click on your, uh, on your HDA, on your HDA, you go to type properties, which brings up its, uh, its, its UI. And if you go to the parameters for it, you can, while this view is open, go inside and drag any parameters over here onto the interface, and they get immediately uh, uh, sort of linked through. So I go apply, and you can see now that, that these are all channel links 
to the top of the HDA. So I've got extra controls here. Super cool. Sometimes you don't need uh, an HDA. You just want like a little controller null like this to control a bunch of stuff. So you might think, well, I'm going to do the same thing. So I'm going to right click on this guy. I'm going to go to uh, edit the parameter interface because this is an HDA. We're just modifying these parameters. And I'm going to say, well, I'm going to grab this thing and drag it on. And you get this angry warning saying, nope, you can't do it because of this mystery subnet warning thing. Um, you, that is to kind of protect yourself for some reason. I don't quite understand why they do this, but you can turn that off. If you go to the, uh, the gear menu up here and you uh, choose it and you, and you uncheck the big linking parameters outside the subnet, now you can drag and drop as you want. So I'm going to drag on this guy. I'm going to drag on uh, unique points. Why not? And do what I want. Hit apply accept. And now this is a controller to control these nodes. Very handy. So now I could have like a little mini city builder thing and I can control it from this thing up here, which is pretty cool. Fun stuff. Uh, Applet nodes, 23 minutes. Oh, God. Um, so uh, let's dive into this subnet for a sec. Cooking, cooking. And actually kind of display it. So inside here, I've got a grid, which I noise up, add some random colors, probably extrude it a bit, uh, add a blur to soften it off, and, and, and out it goes. So um, the convention when you're working with subnets and whatnot is basically wherever your display flag is, wherever this, this blue thing is, uh, that is what is going to be viewed from outside here. Uh, so I, I've tried to use this, you know, this uh, capital letters outs conventions so that I know clearly this is my output thing. But a thing that happens pretty often with production is uh, you might be sort of you know, testing this and just sort of working with it and you go, okay, yep, that's what I expect uh, at that point. And then you, you go up and you walk away and this is what is going to be output downstream. You can very easily forget to move your display flag back down to where it's meant to be. Um, at some point recently, uh, Subfix added this output node. Now, whoop, there it is. Um, if this is in the subnet or anywhere, you get this, this, this orange glow around it. Uh, and this tells Houdini, no, no, no matter where my display flag is up here, when I jump up and out, it knows that that is what it should be outputting to the rest of Houdini. So it saves you from yourself. So if you want to be really keen, you could maybe delete that null and call this out the thing so that uh, now you've got the best of both worlds. And that's, uh, this will always be outputting the right thing from the subnet. But if I have to refer to this from somewhere else, say using an object merge or something, um, I can find that thing easily within the, the subnet. So I can go there, go to zip out the thing, and there's my output node there as well, and so on. Uh, point of form. Uh, I try to think of a better example for this. I couldn't. It's just the idea that, generally speaking, um, people try and come up with, with really clever solutions for stuff, and uh, nine times out of ten, you just say, "You know what? We just point to form it." Um, it's a just it's a fantastic just kind of catch all. Um, it's like you know the ultimate sort of you know staple gun slash bit of you know bit of blue tack just to to get you out of a tricky spot. Uh, here's a little kind of example where I've got a pig. I've uh, remeshed it to look like this, and then uh, let me turn off the uh, text ring. And I want to point to form it. So I want to. So I've scattered some, some points on, on the pig. Uh, I've uh, moved the, those points a bit as a simple deformer, and I'm going to now run those two things to a point to form. So point to form requires the mesh to be deformed. Uh, the the controlling thing in its rest state, and then the deformed version of that thing. So you feed all those things through to point form, and you get a deformed mesh. So I can now uh, choose this edit sop, and I can move points. Hang on. Gerald demo. That's one there. Ah, man. Yeah. So I can move this thing, and I can. Um, you know, edit the shape. But what's nice is that uh, I can change the uh, the values on this uh, on this rematch node, and it will still just work. So it can be a remarkably sort of uh, topologically invariant solution to things. Like you just, as long as you have uh, 
these two nodes kind of roughly correspond, the point of form will do what you want. Oh my god, three minutes. Um, how many minutes left to go? Oh. Too many. Oh, quite Siri, I know. Um, <laughs> so, do, 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 point of form, uh, parenting. Uh, okay, so here is a shape, and here it is being uh, transformed. And I want to parent a camera to this thing. Um, a way to do that uh, is with a, a rivet. It's something that I think is, isn't often covered. I have to kind of remember how to do this. But photo is basically, I've got a camera. I'll go to follow cam. And with this rivet node, you just point it to some uh, geometry location. You can see it's in this capital letter thing, so I can find it easily. You tell it which points to bind to, and now this is a moving thing up at the object level, which I can then parent a camera beneath, and the camera will now move with it. And you can see what's going on. So that is now sliding along with it. If I jump out the camera, you can see if I make the camera visible, that uh, the camera is now dragging along with that shape. Very simple. Um, there are other tricks for doing parenting, which I'll get. Do I get to that one? Kind of, yeah. Um, kind of re re related to that is um, NDC, normalized display coordinates. So what that means is uh, you can have uh, Houdini and Vex uh, tell you where something is in relation to uh, a camera generally. So normalized display coordinates means um, so uh, I've got a camera. And let me see if I can use my webcam view there. Uh, you can say that from my camera, from my camera POV, I'm going to say that that corner down there is going to be uh, zero zero. That corner up there is going to be one one. <laughs> and then uh, I'm going to say, uh, show me where any geometry is uh, using that new coordinate value space. Um, so here, for example, I've got. Um, this thing. So I've got Flippy here and a bit of text, and uh, I want to parent that under a camera. So what I can do is uh, I can use uh, this little vex call, so from MDC, and I and, and point to a camera, which is my orbit cam. If I look through my orbit cam and I view this node, you can see that this is now in the space of the camera. I'll just reset it to what the default values are. So what I've done is I've taken uh, uh, the bounding box values for this shape. And I've said now map those bounding box values into the space of the camera, and this is now sitting directly in the camera. Uh, it means that no matter where the camera moves, um, this thing will follow along. I can then even sort of modify those bounding box values, so I can say, you know what, just go into say the lower third of the camera of the camera, and it will just sit happily down in the corner there, which is pretty handy. You can do the reverse, where um, I could Take this thing, and I can say, well, actually, from this other camera, um, show me how this would look if I was back at the origin. What this looks like in terms of normalized display coordinates. So you get this 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 pretty cool thing, which is now this geometry is going to transform as if it's as if I've taken the, the screenshot from the camera, I've made the camera coordinates be square, and I've plonked it back at the origin. Um, Matt Ebb had some really cool tricks for this that, that he showed at Secret Asia last year. Uh, I believe there are some tricks people do for, say, curved motion blur relative to camera. It's just one of those things that once this is in your uh, bag of tricks, it's quite a handy thing to know. Um, it's interesting sort of comparing this to, uh, I guess, what you would do by default, which is if I had, say, um, this node and I have uh, my out titles here and I want to just parent this beneath the camera, which, which I can do, um, it can work like that. So if I look at the camera again. Uh, and then I've got to you know, move and adjust this thing relative to it, but it can just be a little bit uh, janky to work with, so I tend to not use it anymore. 31 minutes. Oh, God, okay. I might have to play this whole thing at 25% faster. Um, object merge wildcards. This is a handy one. Um, so up here, I have some objects, and I want to pull all these into SOPs to, to, to play with it once. Um, if I... Um, that off. Um, so if I merge in, if I try to merge in those shapes, which is uh, what's that? The torus. So I can bring in the torus, but I'm going to bring in multiple things. So I want to bring the sphere as well, but I can't. I can't multiple 
select things in here, I can just choose one, one at a time. I can have multiple objects, so I can do this thing. So I can have you know, the torus and then the, whoop, the sphere and then the platonic solid. But this is kind of awkward as well. Uh, what is quite handy is that this thing does actually support uh, bulk cards. So as it happens, I'm pretty sure that all the objects I am after all end in one. So let's look at that again. So yeah, torus one, sphere one, and platonic one. And there's a few other things there as well. But I can just go obj star one, and now they're all pulled in. That's pretty handy. Uh, where are we? Yeah, it's good. Um, edge script variables and vex. Um, this is a bit of a tricky one. So I've got this little vex function where I'm using a bit of uh, matrix uh, rotation functions to uh, rotate stuff. So uh, I define a matrix, I define an axis, and I'm going to rotate stuff around. Uh, and I want this to, to, to rotate um, evenly every 90 degrees every second. But if I look from, from, from the top, um, it's not doing it right. And that's because I think, oh, God, that's right. Most of these functions don't take in uh, angles, they take in radians. They go, oh, OK, how does one do radians again? Oh, it's like something about pi or something. So I go, it's like 3.14 or something like that. Uh, divided by 2, I think, is how you get 90 degree increments. Um, there you go, so that's doing it. Um, but uh, what if you want like super accurate pi? Well, um, a handy trick is you can use, and even though this is, this is in VEX, you can use dollar capital letters uh, pi. And that works. How is that happening? How, 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 can, you, how can you use H script variables in VEX? The answer is, uh, where I'm typing here, this is, a, this is a parameter interface. So this is still ultimately in that sort of H scripting world before it takes the contents of, of this of this text field and pass it down to VEX. So that means that anything which is using uh, variables, Houdini will, will do will look for variables first and substitute them and then feed it down to VEX. You can see that if you uh, middle click on the title here. So if I do that, you can see up, oh, it's going to substitute for a variable. That means that stuff where you would otherwise think, oh my god, I've got to you know, carefully cast edge script variables down into VEX at a detail level to do stuff. You actually don't need to. You can just call it directly. Handy little trick. And the last tip, I'm not too bad, 30 minutes, I can I can give us that, uh, is uh, the VOP library. So uh, here is a line. And uh, I want to do some manipulation of these positions. So this has a few points on it. So this is like two hundred points across, I believe. Um, so I could do something like a simple vex thing to say uh, the y position uh, will be driven by the, the x position and get a nice straight line. Uh, I could run it through a power function. Uh, so you get a curve on it, and I can slide these values around. That's that's also fine. Um, but uh, what if I want something where it's kind of it bends and flows down and then bends up. I want a more specific uh, shape. Uh, so I might be able to use a, a ramp for that. So this is kind of this is kind of the shape I'm after. So I've just basically manually constructed that using uh, using a ramp. Um, but I want this to I kind of know in my head what it wants to be. I want this to be sort of uh, you know pivoted around the center and to be sort of tilting around. At the moment that that'd be kind of eyeballing it really. I'd have to sort of be doing this sort of stuff and it's probably not quite right. I know that there is a function to do it and it's called gain, but gain doesn't exist in VEX. Or does it? Um, handy trick from uh, Jake Rice and Lorne and a few others uh, is that uh, all of the uh, the functions and stuff in, in VOPS is available to, to, to VEX if you know where to look. So if you do this line, include buffer.h, um, then you get uh, access to a whole bunch of uh, bonus functions, one of which is this bop gain. So now this is exactly what I want, this nice sort of um, kind of spinning around the middle, adding contrast tool. Super cool. Uh, that file lives in, if I can remember, uh, so you go to where it is installed, which is on my C drive, which we do. Uh, into this form, no, not many them. Uh, it's in C, print files, 
Uh, it's not uh, nope, that one, the other one, side effects software, yep, 18, uh, Houdini, uh, that I believe, includes, here we are, and there is a buffer.h, and if you open that up in a, uh, in Sublime, uh, or any sort of text editor, Uh, there it is there. Oh, not that. Not that. Is, um, so, so, so here you can see all the kind of cool, fun stuff that you can play with. Um, super handy. Um, so you can see how cool. they define a lot of their noise functions and stuff. And I think down the bottom somewhere is the Bob game tool. Uh, that's it. I'm going to end this up quickly. Uh, thank you, Ben, for hanging out. Any other things or stuff you want to say, Ben? Yeah, lots of them. I, uh, I feel like a power user now. <laughs> uh, ben, your pitch. Um, that's my talk. Okay, thanks everyone. Bye.